politics. We've got Steve Erie Vladimir, and Vladimir Kogan from University of California, San Diego, and our own uh, uh, local colleague, Scott McKenzie from UC Davis uh, and the UC Center, and they're going to talk to us about Paradise Plunder. Thank you very much for coming. Well, the first person I'd like to thank is John Milton, the English 17th century poet who wrote about the fall of man, what was sexist in those days, Paradise Lost. That was the inspiration for the title of Paradise Plunder. Our story today is about the fall of San Diego. Now, I'm going to be a landscape artist, and Vlad and Scott will be the portrait artist. I'm going to give you the overview, and then we're going to focus in on the city pension and fiscal crisis, and it's over now, redevelopment San Diego style. Now, there are two San Diegos. The San Diego the tourists see, that the Chamber of Commerce and the Convention and Visitors Bureau love for the world to see, and that's sunshine, beaches, golf courses, high-tech industries, and the like. That's the private sunshine. That's not the story we're telling. We're telling the story of the local government, or as we call it, public. Noir. Now, there's a huge debate in San Diego these days in terms of whether governance in San Diego is a success or a failure. The mayor of San Diego has basically said that the budget crisis is over, we finally balanced it, we're a model for pension reform in terms of redevelopment, right? Downtown, Petco Park, East Village is a model public-private partnership. San Diego is a government success. We're the contrarians. <laughs> We're going to argue that San Diego government, notwithstanding the spinmeister in City Hall, <laughs> who has the largest PR staff of any public official in California, <laughs> larger than Senator Dianne Feinstein's, communication staff, but salted away in other departments, so it's not on his way. <laughs> but we're going to argue, right, that there are systematic governance and fiscal problems that continue in San Diego. Now, understand, this was a difficult book to write, because the plot line kept changing and getting darker <laughs> as the events and years unfolded. When we started this back in 2006, the working title was Troubled Paradise, and the subtitle was Governance Challenges. Fast forward to when the book is published in 2011, and suddenly it's Paradise Plunders. And it's not Governance Challenges, it's Governance Failures. <coughs> what had happened in the interim? The pension deficit kept growing, particularly with the Great Recession of 2008, and suddenly we had over a $2 billion intractable pension deficit. We didn't learn from the great wildfires of 2003 how to fight these things. We got a second one, and with no better outcome, in 2007. But we congratulated ourselves on the ability of middle-class white families in SUVs to hightail it down to Qualcomm, unlike those poor blacks without public transit in Ward 9 in New Orleans with Hurricane Katrina. Well, we didn't seem to learn much in terms of firefighting as well, so hence the tone of the book gets, and the title and subtitle, get darker. Now, you have to understand about San Diego, it is the Rodney danger field of American cities. It gets no research or respect. There's not much written on San Diego. Now, 
as good urbanist. And I certainly found this out with my first book, Rainbow's Inn. I was able to rip off tons of secondary research on New York, Chicago, San Francisco, Boston, not San Diego. Terra incognito. So what we had to do is we had to actually do primary research. There's about 30 to 40 interviews that we did with current and former city officials, community activists, and other stakeholders and knowledgeables. And these were incredibly candid interviews because Stanford Press, like most presses, is run by the lawyers. I can't even use a person's name without getting a waiver form signed, let alone quoting them. And it was amazing the things that we were able to use in terms of the interview material, even after they signed the waiver forms. Public documents. <coughs> we have how many pages long is the goal report? Glad, how long? It's over a thousand. Over a thousand pages. Vlad is one of the four people in captivity <laughs> who's read it cover to cover on San Diego's pension and fiscal problems. So, primary material, also involvement in civic affairs. I hate to say this, but I'm one of the authors of San Diego's strong mayor system. By the time that it went to the ballot to become permanent, I voted against it. We'll talk about that a little bit later, maybe in terms of the q and I've been involved in the water wars and debates, airport debates. Vlad, Scott have been involved in pension issues, redevelopment issues. So there's a lot of what we call participant observation in this book. And then finally, to put San Diego in comparative context. And then at the same time, to be able to tease out causality. We call it in the business independent variables. We needed a larger set of cases upon which to compare San Diego. So we benchmark with the other California big cities, except for San Francisco. Why did we throw San Francisco out? The audience participation. Because it's a county. Hello, yes, it's a city county. In terms of spending, revenue, it throws everything out. So even throwing San Francisco. But we do benchmark, going all the way back to the 1970s, voting patterns, debt, revenue, pension, with the other California big cities. Okay. This is the book. It's actually divided into three parts. Chapters 1 and 2, Overview and Historical Development. And look carefully at the title of Chapter 2, which is the history. It gets you up to 1990, which is where the main story is told. Never, never La La Land. What does that mean? That means you cannot understand modern San Diego unless you understand the historic competition for infrastructure and regional development with dreaded Los Angeles. And we tell that story of competition, and particularly infrastructure, railroads, water, harbor development in chapter one, and how San Diego gets the Navy as the consolation prize as Los Angeles gets growth and industrialization. But the focus of the book is chapters 3, 4, 5, and 6. This is the city of San Diego, 1990 to 2010. And as you can see, we look at the financial side, the impact on public services, we look at planning, and finally we take a look at redevelopment. And then the last two chapters at the crossroads, we put the city in a regional and binational context, and then we look at the various proposals for reform that are being considered in San Diego and other places. Look, one of the central puzzles of this book is that you have not one but two governments in the city of San Diego. You've got big government and you've got little government. We're cutting hours in the neighborhoods with recreation centers, but plans a little harder to do without a redevelopment agency downtown for a new Charger Stadium. Cutting hours at local libraries. We're in the process of building the Storybook Library, the central library downtown. 
No money to maintain the crown jewel of San Diego Balboa Park, but plans well on their way with the financing system now <coughs> for expanding yet again the convention center. So one of the paradoxes and one of the puzzles that we take a look at is why do we have big government downtown with large concentrated benefits, it begins to answer itself, and small government in terms of inadequate public services in the neighborhoods. That's the puzzle. In terms of answering that puzzle, I'm going to first turn it over to Vlad to talk about small government. Why citywide <coughs> services, right? There's so little revenue to deliver them. And then to the finish line. And we expect a very strong finish, Scott. <laughs> but big government downtown, why downtown San Diego looks like the Emerald City and the Wizard of Oz, at least from a distance, but first laugh. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everyone, for being here. So first, the first thing I want to go, go through is uh, the conventional wisdom in San Diego. Certainly, if you ask people in San Diego, why is it that the city has this strange mix of priorities? As Steve mentioned, spending downtown on projects that really benefit very few and very little spending outside of downtown. And there's a variety of explanations that we call conventional wisdom that you get depending on who you talk to, people on the right, people on the left. So we have a councilman, Carl DeMaio, uh, likely, very possibly, the next mayor of San Diego, who is a very conservative Republican. And if you ask him why does San Diego have these problems, he will tell you it's because of greedy public employees and their powerful union bosses who are pulling the strings behind the scenes and extracting these Cadillac pensions that are pushing everything else out of the budget. Now, if you ask people on the left why do we have these problems, you get a very similar explanation. They'll tell you that you know, public officials are either stupid or they're corrupt, and they're in the, in the pocket of the development industry. They're in the pocket of the tourism industry. And then finally, across the board, everyone will tell you that there's just too much waste, fraud, and abuse. And if you just ran San Diego like a business, you have none of these problems. So very similar to the explanations you hear, in fact, all over the place you hear in Sacramento about the state budget crisis, and you hear elsewhere. Now, we don't believe that any of these explanations actually do a very good job of explaining what's going on in San Diego. And instead, as political scientists, we really identify three, three factors that we think are critical to understanding policy outcomes in San Diego. And they're really divided into the masses, the voters, and then the elites. And so we start, as, as political scientists, we really start with the assumption that public officials are actually really smart people, and they really want to get reelected, and they face constraints on what they can do. And these constraints create incentives to do things that we might not like. And they create disincentives to do things that, that might be beneficial for the city as a whole. And you have to identify where these incentives come from to understand the outcomes that you see. So the first factor we focus on is really preferences of voters, voter behavior. And as, as uh, Scott mentioned, uh, as, as he did a great job collecting a lot of this data, we show that voters in San Diego are really atypical compared to the average California voter. On fiscal issues, they're more conservative. Uh, and this has important implications because they really they don't want to spend any money, yet at the same time, they have very high expectations about what they think government should provide. And there's a disconnect between what they're willing to pay and what they expect government to give them. And that creates incentives for certain kinds of candidates, and we call them new fiscal populists, to run who say, if you elect me, I'll give you all the services you want without asking you to pay a penny more. And once in office, they, they face the problem because they have to deliver on the promises that they made. And this creates incentives to pursue very strange policies that, over the long term, might not be in the interest of the city. But moving away, away from, the, from the masses, we also look at elites. And certainly, if you look at the literature on urban politics, you understand that you cannot understand local government without looking at, at business, at, at the role of business. Because, if, for many reasons, much of what local government does is about uh, courting business, it's about growing the local economy, and so businesses play an important role in setting the agenda and structuring what policies actually get on the agenda and what policies people talk about. And to understand why San Diego is unique in this respect, we really draw on an analogy uh, from a book by Mansur Olson, who was an economist. 
And he's writing about China, and the puzzle that Olson is trying to explain is in China, during the feudal period, you have these bandits who are running little fiefdoms, and yet there's variations. So there's some bandits that are love the citizens, uh, think very highly of them, and there's other bandits who are, who are hated. And both types of bandits, they plunder and they pillage, yet one is life and the other is not. And so the question is, why do you see these different outcomes? And Olsen argues that there's really a difference, because some of these bandits are stationary, and some of these bandits are roving, and they go from place to place, village to village. And if you are a citizen, you really want to have a stationary bandit. Because they're still going to pillage, they're still going to plunder, but they're going to realize that if they're going to be there for a long time, it's in their interest to invest in things like infrastructure, to invest in the economy, because the larger the economy, the, the larger the size of the pie, the larger your slice of that pie. So stationary bandits, even though they're no less self-interested than the roaming bandits, have greater incentive to invest in things that have broad benefits, broad spillovers. And for a variety of reasons, we argue that the private sector in San Diego is really much more of a roving bandit than the stationary bandit for a variety of reasons. So first, <laughs> San Diego is quintessentially a branch plant town. So it's a large city, it's a large metropolitan area, but there's very few major corporations that are headquartered there. And in fact, for the most part, most of the business presence is in the form of branch plant offices. And that has important implications because if you are a businessman in San Diego, you probably work for one of these corporations. But you realize if you're doing a good job five to ten years from now, you're not going to be in San Diego. You're going to be in San Francisco. You're going to be in Atlanta. And that has very important implications for your career incentives. Right? Your personal incentives are not to get involved in local government because there's a very good chance you're not going to be around five to ten years from now. And then the other side of it is the, the industry mix. So San Diego in some ways was very lucky in that we developed in a very clean way, unlike LA, primarily focused on the tourism industry. But that has implications because unlike other kinds of businesses, the tourism industry really doesn't have a whole lot of incentive to care about what's going on in the city because they make all their money from people that come in from elsewhere. So as long as the tourism amenities are nice, as long as people come to San Diego, if you're a hotel owner, you're not really going to care a whole lot about how well the city is run and how well how high the quality of services it is for everybody else. And finally, we look at uh, political institutions, which really structure the way in which the masses and the elites come together, and in the way in which their preferences get translated into public policies. And San Diego, we argue, is unique because, like other California cities, but not perhaps cities outside of the West, voters really play very much a direct role. So if you're a public official in San Diego, it's very difficult to do major things without having to go to the voters. So in the city of San Diego, our city charter guarantees free trash collection. If you want to charge for trash collection, you have to get the voters to approve changing the city charter. If you want to raise taxes in the city of San Diego, you as a public official can't do so without going to the voters to get the majority and sometimes even two-thirds of them, two-thirds of them to say yes. And there's a variety of other political institutions. So for example, look at term limits and the implications term limits have for the time horizons of public officials. But equally important, as Steve mentioned, we have an unusual system that really blends the historical machine model with a strong mayor with a, and, and district elections uh, with, with other institutions that are more familiar in the, in the West, more reformed institutions. And so we have this interesting mix in which we have a city council elected by district and we have a mayor elected at large. And then in the United States, under the, uh, under the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Constitution, when we draw political districts, we draw them to have equal population. But districts with the same number of people don't necessarily have the same number of voters. And in San Diego, for a variety of reasons, because the city is very much geographically segregated, drawing districts with the same number of people means that certain city council districts have about half as many voters as other districts. So that has the, the effect of really skewing who gets on the city council. And for the most part, the city council it results in a city council that's more liberal than the median San Diego voter. And yet, if you want to, and so, so the city council is more liberal, they want to spend more than perhaps the median voter. Yet, if they want to raise money to match that spending, they have to go to the voters, and then the median voter really plays a role. And so you have a disconnect between who the city council represents and the institution that really spends money, and, then, and, the, and, who, and who gets to raise taxes. And there's a disconnect that creates a gridlock, and it creates a lot of the problems that we see. So that's sort of the big picture, and, and we, we argue that these few factors explain the policy outcomes that you see in San Diego. And so perhaps one of the policy outcomes that gets the most, most attention is 
really the quality of life in the city, and the level of public services. So if you look across a wide range of public services, really basic services like fire protection, libraries, over the past 10 years, you've seen quality of life in San Diego really deteriorate pretty dramatically. So over the, over the last 10 years, for example, recreation center hours have been cut by about a third on average in the neighborhoods. Uh, library branches have been, hours have been cut by about 25%. And the puzzle is why, why is this the case? Why has San Diego quality of life gotten so much bleaker? And the short answer is public <coughs> pensions. So 15 years ago, about 5% of the city's budget, the day-to-day -day budget that pays for firefighters and pays for cops, about 5% of that budget went to pay for uh, public pensions. And today, that number is close to 20%. So one-fifth of the entire budget goes into the city's pension system, and it's projected to stay at 20% for the next two decades. Now, over this 10-year period, this 15-year period, the city budget hasn't grown all that much. City revenues haven't grown all that much. So you have a pie that's about the same size, and you have the pension slice of that pie that's about four times as large, which means everything else has to get cut in order to pay this growing pension bill. So things like libraries, things like police protection, fire protection, have gotten cut. In San Diego, this, in some ways, the, the effect of these cuts has been more painful because San Diego has never been a high, particularly high service city. So if you look at spending in the city of San Diego, for every resident. Uh, in the late night, in the early 1970s, San Diego is very similar to the other major California cities. And over time, there's a gap that's, that's opened up. Uh, and in fact, today, San Diego spends about a third less than the average large California city. And this is important because cutting in San Diego is going to have harsher consequences than cutting in places like LA. But also important, I think, and, and the, 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 the slide, I think, drives the point home that the problems in San Diego are not due to outrageous spending, out of control city spending. So certainly compared to major other California cities, San Diego is really a low spending, low expenditure city. And certainly if you were to expect, if you were to predict in say the late 1990s which cities would have the biggest budget problems, San Diego would not be at the top of the list because again, it is not a city that has spent particularly large compared to other places. So why, why is it that today San Diego spends about a fifth of its total budget on pensions? And as Steve mentioned, we have a $2.2 billion pension liability, which means if you add up all the benefits that have been promised to public sector employees, and you add up all the revenue that the city has set aside to pay for those benefits, there's a gap, and the present value of that gap is about $2 billion. And to put that in perspective, that's about double the size of the city's annual budget. And the question is, how do we get this pension gap? And certainly, again, a lot of the conventional wisdom has to do with, with benefit levels. And we argue that that's really not the case. You have to look at critical policy decisions that were made, and you have to understand the incentives and the rationality of public officials who made these decisions. And so, in many ways, the story really starts in the late 1970s. So San Diego uh, has always had low taxes, and it was hit particularly hard after Proposition 13 in the way that the state decided to divvy up property taxes after Proposition 13. And so the city really faced a, a budget problem. It had needs that were much greater than the revenue it had to, to pay for them. And it had to find some way to do this. And at the time, we had a very entrepreneurial mayor who became governor, Pete Wilson. And the mayor had an idea. So at the time, public employees were in Social Security and Medicare, which you know, as you, many of you know, the way we pay for Social Security and Medicare is through a payroll tax. Half of that tax is paid by employees, but half that tax is paid for by the employer. And so the mayor had this great idea. He came to public employees and said, if you guys leave Social Security and Medicare, it's going to be good for you because your take-home pay is going to go up. But it's also going to be good for us because we won't have to pay that payroll tax. And that's going to free up about 5% of payroll that we can use to pay for other services. And to make this worthwhile for you public employees, here's what we'll do. If you voluntarily leave Social Security and Medicare, the city will give you free health care for life. And it's not going to cost you anything. So public employees thought about this and said, oh, sounds like a good idea. We get more pay, we get health care, so we won't need Medicaid, Medicare. The problem is that the city never actually set aside any money to pay for this health care benefit. And instead, starting in the 1980s, really essentially started taking money out of the pension system to pay for retiree health care benefits, even though actuarially it is a system that was never designed to pay for those benefits. Now, this freed up some money initially, but by the early 1980s, this wasn't enough. So, the city's needs were growing, and again, there was a budget problem. 
And at the time, the market was doing well. And as some of you know, the way we pay for pensions in the United States, for public pensions, is we as taxpayers and then employees set aside some money when they first start working. And over the course of many years, as they work, that money is invested. And through the magic of compound interest, when they retire, there should be enough money left aside to actually pay for the benefits. And to make this work, the magic number for the annual rate of return is about 8% in the city of San Diego. So as long as the city makes about 8% each year on its investments, there should be enough money set aside to pay for those benefits. And in the early 1980s, the city was doing really well. It was making more than 8%. And rather than say, this is a good year, which probably means down the road there's going to be a bad year when we make less than 8%, the city said, you know, we only need 8%, we're making 10 12%. So anything over this magic number is surplus earnings. It's surplus, we don't need it, so we're going to spend it on something else. We're going to take half that money, and we're going to use it to increase the benefits of retirees. We're going to take the other half, and we're going to use that to spend things that we want the city to provide. We're going to essentially take money out of the pension system and put it in the city budget. And this too worked for a while, until the early 1990s. There was a recession, city revenues were hit. And we had another entrepreneurial mayor who also wanted to run for higher office, uh, Susan Golding, who wanted to be a senator. And the way she was going to become senator, she was going to do high profile things that really put San Diego on the national map. She was going to bring the Republican National Convention to the city and host it there. She's going to build a brand new downtown ballpark for the San Diego Padres. But to do that, she needed money. So if you're going to have a big convention, you needed the right security, which means you need to pay overtime to cops. And there was just no money in the city budget to pay for that. At the same time, there's some evidence that public employees in the city were paid relatively less than public employees in nearby jurisdictions. And this was creating really a recruitment and retention problem for the city. And so the city was negotiating with its unions over compensation. And so the, the, the mayor and the city, they came to public employees and said, here's what we'll do, we'll make you a deal. So we know you guys are relatively underpaid. We don't have any money to pay you more, but here's what we'll do. Well, instead of giving you higher salaries now, we'll give you higher pensions when you retire. Fortunately, all this will be turned out, so we won't really have to worry about how we're going to pay for those benefits. <laughs> but in exchange, if you, want, if you want those benefit increases, here's what you have to do. You're going to let us pay less into the pension system than the actuary says we should. And then we're going to use some of that money to build a new ballpark, and then use some of that money to pay for overtime for cops to host the, con the convention. And in case things get bad, and what could get bad, you're increasing benefits, but you're paying less. Here's what we'll do. In case things get really bad, there's going to be a, a level, there's going to be a threshold beyond which if the pension system falls beyond that point, we as a city are going to make a massive lump sum payment to bring the pension system back up to where it needs to be. So there's really some guarantee. We'll underfund now, but if it, underfunding gets really bad, we'll make you whole. And public employees thought about this and said, well, we get more benefits. We're not really giving, giving anything up. And they decided to go along with it. And because public employees control the majority on the pension board, which makes policy for the pension system, this was approved. And in 2001, there was a recession. There was 9-11, there was a recession. So tourism revenue was down. Sales tax revenue was down. And because the stock markets were down, the pension system lost a lot of its <coughs> investments. And in fact, we reached that threshold where the city was on the hook to make a massive lump sum payment. The problem, again, was that this was a recession year, so city revenues were down, sales tax, property tax was down, and this was really the year in which the city could least afford to pay more into the pension system. So, public, so city officials went back to the unions and said, you know, we know we promised to make this massive lump sum payment, and we just can't do it. We're talking about laying off firefighters, we're talking about laying off cops, and politically we just can't make a larger pension payment, even <coughs> we're cutting services for everybody else. So here's what we'll do. You pension employees who control the majority of the pension board, let us not make that payment. And in fact, let us continue underfunding the pension system. And in exchange, we'll increase your benefits again. So when you retire, you get a more generous pension. And public employees thought about this and said, well, we get higher benefits. Doesn't seem like we're giving anything up. Sounds like a good idea. And so they signed off on this. And so as a result, a couple years later, when all this was exposed, the city has a massive $2.2 million pension liability. And so you might wonder, you know, there was a variety of decisions that were made throughout the years of a variety of policy levers. So starting in the 1980s, we systematically took money out of the pension system to pay for retiree health care, which this system was never designed to pay. Starting in the early 1980s, we took surplus earnings out. We took money out of the pension system and put them in the city budget. And starting in the 1990s, we really started underfunding the pension. 
And we also gave employees benefit increases. How much did these different policy components, these policy levers, how much did they contribute to this massive liability? Because again, if you, if you look at the conventional wisdom, if you read the Union Tribune in San Diego, they'll tell you it's all about benefits. If we, haven't get, get, if we didn't give public employees those outrageous pensions, we wouldn't have this $2.2 billion liability. So in fact, about a year and a half ago, the pension system hired an outside actuary to go through and figure out how much did these various things contribute. In particular, how much did these two underfunding proposals and benefit increases, Manager's Proposal 1 in 1996, Manager's Proposal 2 in 2001, and a separate legal settlement, how much did the benefit increases themselves cause this pension liability? And the answer was, you know, it's a big number, it's about $300 million, but it's only about 15% of this total pension liability. So benefit increases themselves account for a relatively small amount of this problem. And it's interesting because when you look at, again, the various policy proposals in San Diego, how do you fix this problem? We're not talking about cutting benefits by 15%, we're talking about closing the entire gap, fixing 100% of the problem by really going after employee benefits. And so there is really a disproportionality, there's really a disjunction between the problems that caused this massive liability and the solutions that are really at the top of the agenda to fix it. Now, a substantial, another, perhaps the second biggest cause is investment losses. And like most public pensions in, in California and the United States, increasingly over the last 20 years, the pension system has really taken on greater risk. So instead of investing in bonds and mortgages, the pension system really goes out and gambles on the stock market. During good years, that pays very high dividends. You make a lot of earnings. During bad years, not only do you not make high earnings, do you not make any earnings, but you actually lose money. In 2008, in the financial crisis, the pension system lost about a billion dollars, about a fifth of its entire investment portfolio, because it was so exposed on these risky investments. Now, how do you move forward? So certainly, this has been a problem in San Diego for almost a decade, and there's still today big debates about how do you take, how do you fix pensions, because until you fix pensions, you can't fix anything else. Until you find a way to cut down the pension bill, you can't talk about restoring services, you can't talk about giving constituents the things that they really want. And one of the big proposals on the ballot, and it's certainly been in the news a lot, people over California are following this, is this proposal in June to essentially close down the pension system to new hires, instead of giving them these generous defined benefit pensions, give them essentially a 401k, the same types of pensions that people get in the private sector. Now this has got a lot of attention, uh, the mayor goes on uh, Fox News and CNBC and says, this is really the model for the nation. This is how you fix these pension problems that all governments today are facing. And if you look at the numbers, in many ways it's problematic because this is not going to do, do a whole lot to fix the problem. Partly because in 2007, the city created essentially a two-tier pension system. So all new hires in the city of San Diego today really get a much less generous pension than all previous hires. And in fact, that pension is so, so skimpy that it's the equivalent in the private sector to Social Security and then a very modest 401k, the average 401k that you see uh, in the private sector. So in fact, the cost of the pension benefits is not very high. And, and the problem is that this proposal to close the pension system and give all new hires 401ks is not going to do anything to deal with this $2.2 billion liability because all this liability is for current employees, for benefits that they've already earned. And simply creating new benefit, different stream of benefits for new hires, there's absolutely nothing to deal with the employees who are actually the ones responsible for this massive liability. So that's one of the problems with this proposal. The other proposal is that it actually costs more. So closing the pension system and creating a new 401k system over the next 30 years is going to cost about $10 million more than the equivalent cost of the current pension plan. And so the only way that this proposal actually does anything to cut down this massive liability is through a measure that not a whole lot of people talk about, no one really points to this as the model for the nation, but it's really a five-year pay freeze on, on public sector compensation in San Diego. And it's important because of the formula used to calculate pensions is based on salary, so if you, if you freeze salaries for five years and you assume that they're going to stay five years below where they would be today, that creates a substantial amount of savings. So all of the savings, and then some in this proposal, really come from this five-year pay freeze, which is going to fix the pension problem, it's going to create other potential challenges. So certainly firefighters and other specialized employees are probably not going to sit around for five years, especially as the economy starts to recover, and they'll start looking around to other nearby jurisdictions 
that not only don't have a pay freeze, but also still have a traditional uh, defined benefit pension system. So now we're going to transition from the, from the dark fiscal picture to really sort of the success story in San Diego, the downtown redevelopment. I'll turn it over to Scott. So uh, it's, pretty e it's pretty easy to see the pension case as an episode of governance failure. There's probably very little debate about that. Uh, most people would say it's pretty easy to see that San Diego's redevelopment program, the, the way that San Diego's redeveloped its downtown over the past couple of decades, is an easy success story. And in fact, if you sort of think back to what San Diego's downtown looked like in the 1960s and 70s, it wasn't a very nice place to live, it wasn't a very nice place to do business, and in fact there was some talk among civic, civic elites about actually moving downtown away from its place uh, alongside the bay and into Mission Valley where there were a lot of fast-growing uh, sort of businesses and shopping malls and residents were moving there, uh, and this was actually a serious proposal. Uh, fast forward to the present, when San Diego's downtown looks like a gleaming new uh, sort of downtown. It has new infrastructure, uh, sort of better roads, uh, has a downtown ballpark, a new shopping mall, and more residents are living there. And this redevelopment has been fueled by around 12 billion plus in private investment activity. So this seems like a pretty good uh, outcome. I'm going to talk a little bit today about the public side of that redevelopment program. The one plus billion dollars that the city of San Diego has invested uh, in an effort to revitalize its downtown as part of its local uh, program uh, to accommodate the state's redevelopment program, as well as around $742 million from the general fund that the city has supplemented its redevelopment program to build things like the convention center uh, and the downtown ballpark. And I'm also going to sort of discuss the ballpark deal between the city and the San Diego Padres that is responsible uh, for a large part of this redevelopment program and sort of offer an alternative way to see not only the process by which this partnership uh, was concluded and carried out, but also the benefits um, that the ballpark deal created both for those.